Okay, it's chart storm time. So I'm going to try today um, doing a video on um, the chart storm. This is a um, series that I do on Twitter every week um, in the weekend. It kind of depends what time zone you're in as to when it comes out. Um, I'm doing it here in New Zealand on at about um, sort of six, seven o'clock um, in the morning on Sunday morning. So um, I think for um, for a lot of you, um, for for the for my American friends, um, that's going to be arriving on their desk on Saturday afternoons. But um, anyway, what I thought I'd do is um, just try doing a video on it um, and basically go through the charts, where I got them, um, why I put them in today, um, and also a few extra thoughts on them. So here we go, and um, so this is how it usually starts, so a little bit of a warning that it's about to start. That's the account there, so if you haven't um, followed it, make sure that you do, otherwise you're going to be missing out on this. And so number one today um, in this week is the potential bull flag pattern in the S&P 500. And I've noted there that it ne still needs to be confirmed. Um, it, almost, it got very close to confirming there. Um, just a reminder for a bull flag, it actually has to break out to the upside. Um, and you know, time is actually running out on this one. So um, you know, if we don't see a bull flag um, break out from that bull flag um, pattern in the next week, um, then you know, at that point, it's, um, the bull flag pieces uh, goes out the window and we look at the other indicators to see if we can find something else, some better clues and um, one that's probably quite interesting is the um, next one, um, so the um, S&P 500 against its 50 day moving average, um, you can see there we can't quite see but it, it is holding up above the line, it hasn't touched, it only touched it there very briefly. Um, the reason why we look at 50 day moving averages is because it's kind of relevant to the cycle length that you kind of see here on the short term basis. Um, you, know, you can see that when you get a cross down, oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes it'll um, pave the way for a larger move. Um, and, it's, um, and it's certainly one, I'd say that the 50 day moving average and the 200 day moving average are the most closely or widely watched um, moving averages. Everyone has their own favourite ones. but um, on to the next one, I'm trying to keep this um, reasonably quick. So um, uh, this one's the insider transactions ratio and it's put together by Barron's. I've got the link there in the, um, in the tweet storm. Um, and by the way, we're looking at this on um, in moment view, which is um, Twitter's sort of relatively new function where you can um, create what they call a moment where you go and tick a whole bunch of tweets and they'll end up in, um, in the moment that you create. And so this one is insider transactions ratio, um, basically the degree to which um, insiders are selling or buying. Um, and the, 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 the thesis there is that the more that they're selling, um, you know, insiders oftentimes they have a better idea of, um, of the value of, the, um, of their stocks because um, they have a, you know, they should know what's going on with their company. Um, and you know, if they think that price has gotten ahead of itself, then probably if they were going to sell, that would be the time to sell. Um, and um, you know, if they had any information that um, would suggest that things are about to get worse, then they're probably going to be starting to sell as well. So that's why the the little schematic here is that the higher it is, the more selling, um, the more bearish it is, and vice versa. When it comes to bullish, um, you often see that sort of switch around with um, the short term market um, duration. So. Got a bearish signal at the moment. Um, I see this, and it's um, quite a really stark turnaround. Um, when I see that, it makes me sort of ponder because you know, when you see such drastic movements in an indicator, it makes you wonder whether it's actually a true signal or not. So, um, you know, but I'm not sure of the exact way that they put that together. So I'd have to look into that one, and I might do that later. Uh, the next one is. What have we got here? Quick question, is low volatility a bad thing? Um, and you know, obviously we're thinking of bad things as in um, bad times for the market. And um, this chart here, it's by um, my colleagues at Ned Davis, um, competitors actually, but um, they've, they've got some good stuff there. I don't know if it's actually got their um, um, line there, but it's from Tony Welch over there. He's a um, very, good, very good analyst. Um, and we've got here, the 100 day volatility index and you can see there it's um, tracking down you know pretty much as low as it gets um, and you know the idea there is that low volatility is usually seen as a 
sign of complacency. Um, certainly it is when you think of things like the volatility index, the SIBO one, which is based on option pricing, it um, tends to give you those contrarian signals. But you know, if you look at this period here, it's actually, it was actually a pretty good um, time to be in the market. So um, you know, it's, it's, I, I would say that volatility is more of a feature than necessarily um, you know, a signal in this case. Um, most of the time, volatility gives you the best signal when it's spiking, and that's often when it's um, near bottom, uh, market bottom. So um, none of that right now. And on to number five, um, one of my own. So the black line is the average daily movement um, across um, that time period there of the S&P 500. Um, it should be pretty well known by now that this is a seasonally strong part of the year. Um, that time runs out sort of, um, you know, within a month, about a month or so from now. Um, so far it's been tracking more or less in line, um, not as closely as it was last year, but more or less in line. Um, so again, you've only got a short little period of um, positive seasonality to go before you get into what is traditionally the rougher part of the year and which culminates um, around Q3. And on to the next one. So this is um, uh, Lance Roberts here. He's, got, he's put together a, um, another version of, um, of the CAPE which is um, the cyclically adjusted PE ratio. Um, and so in this one, what I understand he's done here is taking a bit of a compromise um, in essence. Um, so, you know, oftentimes the, the, the criticism of the PE 10 or the traditional CAPE is that it's a little bit um, too slow moving or that it's not really a useful market timing signal. Um, and you know, the reason that is because you know, it, it, it's only when it really reaches extremes, and even when it reaches extremes, it doesn't give you a trading signal. It gives you, it's a good signal for longer-term investors. Um, helps inform longer-term expected um, returns. Um, whereas the last 12 months, um, P ratio can be very noisy and give wrong signals. Um, so this is, I guess, a bit of a compromise between them. And um, you know, on this one, so Cape five deviation from. Um, post World War II average it looks like. Um, well, you know, it's, it's up there, it's pretty high. So, um, you know, whether you call being high versus average overvalued, um, you know, it's probably, um, it's a decent um, approximation for being overvalued, I suppose. But um, it's worth keeping in mind that, you know, it's not necessarily overvalued as such, it's just more expensive than or trading at a higher price than it usually does and um, you know, if you there is a school of thought on valuations there that um, that they're not so much or well, the P ratio is more a measure of confidence um, and you know that sort of reflect you can see here hyper hyper levels of confidence there um, expecting um, very rapid growth into the future but you know at this point uh, it's it's certainly up there. Um, it wasn't as high as it got to there, not by a long shot. Um, doesn't doesn't appear to be a very good signal of the top, but you know on the bottom side, um, it's definitely one to have in the toolkit for um, if we do get another good good old market downturn like that one. So next one is number seven. So what we've got here: American institutional investors are cutting exposure to equities. Is it smart money? So this here red line, this chart was from the latest weekly macro themes report. Um, and so this red line is put together by State Street. They use their global custodian business to figure out whether institutional investors are buying or selling equities. And so that line there is the 100 point mark. Um, if this red line is above it, that means that um, institutional investors are increasing their equity exposure if it's below then they're reducing it. So, you know, I guess the way to describe the scenario here is that institutional investors appear to be using this strength to sell down. And I guess that's sort of understandable, you know, um, they would have, you know, just been through this sort of market turmoil here and, um, you know, pretty much looking for an excuse to sell. And, you know, if you think about it, um, 
I mean, you know, some a lot of measures of valuation are um, towards the high side, and at the same time, you've got the Fed hiking rates coming out of um, very unusual monetary circumstances, um, and then you've got you know it's fair to say elevated political risks. So you know, they're probably going to help reconcile while they're um, you know why why they're so um, bearish on this. But you can see that there was um, there's there's been ever since the crisis a bit of a um, bit of a bias to be on the sell side, you know, this, that probably reflects a little bit of crisis trauma or, um, you know, a bit of um, yeah, lasting effects from that. But, um, you know, as I said in that um, question there, or as I alluded to, um, only time will tell whether this is indeed the smart money. Um, but it, so it's another piece of information to put into the pot for now. Next one is margin debt. So, this one here is put together by Ryan Dietrich, very good chartman here, and um, here he's showing the level of margin debt as a percentage of Wilshire 5000 market cap. And that Wilshire 5000 is, I guess, um, probably your next best, or one of the best um, proxies for it, an all market index. Um, the reason why you're comparing it to market cap is um, you know, margin debt, you borrow margin debt to buy stocks. Um, you know, so this is it's pretty logical that you would compare margin debt to um, the total value of stocks to get a um, correct gauge for um, you know to put it in its proper context. Um, and on that bit measure, um, you know, you can see that it, that it's you know it's almost trending up really for this time. And um, you know, I'm not. I mean, the, you, you can see that um, whenever it does get sharply um, sort of. I don't know if you call it out of control, we're sharply out of line, like the last phases of the um, dot-com boom here, you can see that it really spiked up. And likewise in the last phases of the, the pre-financial crisis period. But, um, you know, in this, this period around here, it hasn't really been um, that sort of um, much to get excited about. You know, I would note that margin debt in absolute terms is at all-time all record highs, and um, that was one of the reasons why I put this chart here together and um, shows the S&P 500 against the year-on-year -year change in margin debt. And so what I described it as, um, this one was also in um, the latest weekly macro themes report, um, and what I described this is as the pace of acceleration. So when you get spikes there, it shows that it's growing at a rapid pace, and if it's growing at a rapid pace, then you know it reflects a sense of euphoria and excitement in the market, people are sort of scrambling in, um, chasing returns, it's very natural that investors chase returns, it's um, pretty pretty well documented that um, that's a feature of investor behaviour. Um, and you can see here that in that respect it's not really um, flagging any warning signs, um, so that's one warning sign, the other warning sign is when it does that, you know, so it's basically if it goes too fast or too slow, if it goes too slow, it goes down there, um, you know, that that is a good signal that you're into a bear market then, you know, a big, long, protracted one. Or even here, um, signal that bear, that very short bear market there, short and sharp um, bear market. Um, you know, and even when it went down there, um, um, you know, you didn't get a bear market, but it wasn't that spectacular um, period either. And by the same token, this um, period here, you know, you could probably, you, you call these ones red lights and you call these ones orange lights, I suppose, would be the message. So um, this is one that I'll be coming back to and um, certainly alerting um, my clients to um, should it get into um, the too hot or too cold zones. Um, and so on to the next one, and looks like this is the last one. So passive funds now almost 40% of total US assets under management. So Got this one from um, David Merkel over at the Aleph blog. Puts out lots of very interesting stuff there. And um, so this one is showing you we've got um, so all these bars are on the left hand side. We've got active funds in the grey, greyish, bluish um, kind of colour. Um, not kind of yeah, a little bit of a weird sort of a greyish blue colour. And um, then you've got a grey colour there, which is the index funds. And then um, on top of that is your um, teal colour I suppose, um, greeny teal colour and that's um, ETF money. Um, and so I guess the, the, the point about this one um, is just how far um, passive funds or passive investing has grown. You know, um, 
pretty much double or more than double um, what it was back then. Um, and you know, you could do a whole video on this. You could